All right. That leaves y'all with me. Someone say amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you, we bless you. Thank you for the word of God today. Thank you that every promise of God is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Father, I thank you that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. You've anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to preach deliverance to the captive and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Father, I pray for your word to go forth in power and in spirit, Lord God, that their faith lie not with the enticing words of the wisdom of man, but in the power and demonstration of your spirit. Father, let your Holy Spirit work in their hearts, Father, that we not be vain hearers of the word, deceiving our own selves, but we be wise doers of your word. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said? Amen. 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 So listen, at the beginning of every Sunday morning service for at least the next several weeks, the Holy Spirit's really put on my heart to cover something in Bible prophecy before I bring my message to you. So it's going to be, in Hebrew, we call it a madrash or a short little teaching. So it's going to be a short little mini teaching. Everybody say mini. Mini teaching. So we said last Sunday that there are all these signs, Bible prophecy signs occurring right now. They're almost like if you're in a mall that you've never been in and you don't know where you're at, you look at one of those maps that says you are here, right? So these signs right now are you are here signs as far as where we're at in the timeline as far as the scripture tells us. In Revelation chapter 6 verse 6, the Bible teaches us, I'm going to show you the verse in a minute, that famine due to lack of wheat is going to happen during the tribulation period. Well, this last week, even since we've talked, wheat prices have absolutely surged on reports that 60,000 tons of Ukrainian wheat were destroyed this last week in a Russian missile attack. That's not 6,000, 60,000. And if you look at the wheat futures, now it won't affect your pocketbook this week or next week, but in the months ahead, anything with wheat in it, pasta, everything is going to go up in price, just so you know. Also this last week, because of this, India has announced that they are banning their exports of any rice products to anybody in the world. Now, why that matters is they provide the world with 40% of their rice. So these things are happening right now, and just so you know, that this is but the beginning. Everybody say the beginning. I want to show you this scripture here, and then we're going to start in on the message. This is out of Revelation chapter 6, verse 6. John the Revelator says, I heard what sounded like a voice coming from among the four living creatures, which said a quart of wheat, which is the equivalent of a loaf of bread for a day's wages. How many of you out there work hard for eight hours, men or women? A couple of y'all? Raise your hand. I want to say, how many of you work hard, right? When you work hard for a day's wages, how would you like to get that day's wages and the only thing you have money for at the end of the day is to buy a loaf of bread. So you want to talk about bad inflation? That's what's on the horizon during the tribulation period. So I'm telling you, I'm not saying we're there. I'm just saying these are precursors. These are we are here signs to wake up the believer to get our life right with God and to be doing the work of the Lord. Someone say amen. amen. He says, a quart of wheat, a loaf of bread for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages. But do not damage the olive trees and the vineyards. So that's what's coming up ahead. Amen. That was free. Now I want to continue to talk to you this morning about what I spoke with you about last week, which is the heart of God. Everybody say the heart of God. How many of you know that sometimes Christian people and the world have the wrong idea of who God is in their mind? It's based on a religious um, training maybe that they received. You know, somebody grew up in a uh, Mormon church, let's say when they were younger, their concept of God is God is Mormon, right? Um, <clears throat> somebody grows up in another kind of uh, arena or area, their image of God is based on what they grew up learning. 
But how many of you know that there's only one God? And how many of you know who He really is? He's revealed through the Word of God. He's revealed through the Scripture. We don't have to guess. Someone say amen. How many of you are thankful for that? Amen. I'm glad I don't have to guess who God is. Amen. You see, when I gave my life to Jesus... I didn't know how to become a Christian. I prayed to the Lord that night. I'll never forget. I was like, Lord, because the image of my God was Judaism. I was born and raised in the Jewish faith, the Jewish religion, not just Jewish blood. And so when I was on my knees praying to commit my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I asked God, I said, Lord, how do I become a Christian? Do I shave my head? Why? Why do you think I said that? I wasn't being funny. I really didn't know. Because I saw at that time all over the news was these Harry Krishna people who were at the airports with shaved heads. And that was the image. It was in my head. Uh, do I walk around with a tambourine? What do I do? I didn't know how do I become a Christian. Do I join a church? I said, God, I'm going to open the Bible. And where it opens to, I need to see my answer. Thank God we serve a living God. Amen. Because as you would know it, of course, open the scripture, it opens right to the book of Romans chapter 10. My eyes fall right to verse 9 and verse 10. That if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart God's raised Jesus from the dead, you'll be saved. Hallelujah. I had my answer. Amen. And I started confessing and giving my life to the Lord. Said, Jesus, I believe you're the son of the living God. And God transformed my life. But we have to understand what the heart of God is because you want your idea of who God is to be who he really is. How can you and I share with the world or share with unbelievers about the Lord if we don't know who the Lord is himself, ourselves? Someone say amen. So the title of this message is, What Spirit Are You Of? So we're going to read for a little bit, then we'll get to the gist of it. <clears throat> We believers must not get caught up in the spirit of this world, but find the heart of the Father in every situation. Amen? How many of you know there's a lot of hatred out there? A lot of anger? There's a lot of everything. A lot of people being the victim. A lot of offense. Everybody's offended about everything and anything. Am I right? Have you ever met an offended person? They're all over the news, right? All I got to do is flip the station. There they are. Everybody's offended. Everybody's mad. We believers cannot get up in the spirit of this world because the Bible teaches the spirit of the world in these end times is the spirit of the Antichrist. People look for the Antichrist. His spirit's already here and at work. And it's based on the spirit of hatred, the spirit of lovelessness. Everybody say lovelessness. You and I cannot claim to be a reflection of the Lord when our reflection looks like the world. Amen? Looks like the world. Now, I'm going to pick on Samuel here. I did in Sunday school. You didn't mind, did you, Samuel? You didn't stay there. So listen, Samuel, if you looked in the mirror, okay, and instead of seeing your face, see Samuel over there? He doesn't mind me picking on him either. If you looked in the mirror and saw Samuel's face, it would be kind of weird, wouldn't it? Why? Because you'd expect to see your own reflection in the mirror, right? When you talk to men and women out there, guys, Heavenly Father is expecting them to see a reflection of Jesus in your life. But if your picture that you're showing them looks just like the world, they're not going to be impressed at all. Amen? Why do you think, thank you for your mirror, Cindy. This is not mine. It was borrowed. Just so you all know. Selfie. Kidding. Let me ask you this. If the world expects to see Jesus, or when Heavenly Father expects them to see Jesus in you, and all we're doing is showing them the world, do you think people want the world if they're already in the world? No. No. Why in the world? They're going to say, man, why in the world do I want to be like you? Your life's more goofed up, messed up, and you live like twice the devil that I live. Am I right? The truth is, we need to be reflecting the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody say reflecting Jesus. 
Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus wants you to reflect him. Now look at your other neighbor and say, Jesus wants me to reflect him. Amen. Jesus wants me to reflect him. Amen? How many of you know it's easier said than done? But the problem with the body of Christ in America, I'm just telling you, and it's every church everywhere. Why? Because churches have people. People have problems. People are either going to look like Jesus or they're going to look like the world. As believers, we need to look more and more like Jesus. How many of you have ever driven the twilight as the sun's going down? So the other night, my wife and I were driving and the sun was going down. We were coming home and driving through the hills and had the headlights on. And how many of you know that when the sun's going down, those headlights don't do you a lick of good? I mean, it's really hard to see. But the darker it gets out there, the more the light seems to help. The light ain't gotten any brighter, but it's helping a lot more. The darker it gets in this world, guys and gals, the brighter your light's going to shine for Jesus, I'm telling you. But you got to let it shine. Amen? The love of Christ, and I'm not quoting myself this morning because I actually found a good quote I like. The love of Christ always helps us see beyond the faults of others. Let me say that again. The love of Christ always helps us see beyond the faults of others. Amen? If all you ever see is somebody's faults, spouses, I'm talking to you. Uh-oh. If all you ever see is the faults of your spouse, you're going to be unhappy and miserable all the time. Now, if I see my own faults, now I've got the help of the Holy Spirit to help me weed them out. Amen. But if all I'm doing is looking at the faults of my spouse, I'm sorry, but you're not big enough to fix them. How many of you have tried? Don't raise your hand. You can't fix them. Only God can fix them. So, the only thing that I really have control over is me. Everybody say me. So it's, Lord, you work in me. You show me the issues I've got, and I'm going to trust you to work in my spouse. That's faith. Someone say amen. I want to read it again. The love of Christ always helps us see beyond the faults of others. When you run across those tough individuals at work who are acting like knuckleheads, you need to see beyond how they are today and ask Holy Spirit to help you see them with the eyes of Jesus. Because I guarantee you that God gets a hold of them. They will be different. Amen? So don't just see people how they are. See them how they can be and how they can become. Amen? Isn't that how God sees us? He didn't just see Bruce who was this goofed up, messed up teenager. I mean goofed up. Living on my own. And he just said, oh, man, that, that kid's a waste. Can't do anything with him. He saw who I could be in Jesus. And he's not, I hadn't arrived. I'm still getting there, amen? But 42 years in the polishing machine. And the polishing machine doesn't get easier, guys. It gets harder, amen? Because those rough edges, the easy ones go off first, amen? Now he's working on the other stuff like patience and, Loving kindness. And, amen. And all my staff said. <laughs> John chapter 2, verse 23 and verse 25. Remember, the title of this message is, Do you not know what manner of spirit you're of? Now, when he, Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. Jesus knows everything about everybody. More than three people, please say amen. amen. If you don't believe me, ask him. He knows everything about you. He knows what tone we have towards him. You ever get attitude with somebody? You ever get attitude with God? Come on, we all do, right? He knows it. He knows it. 
Jesus didn't commit himself to them because he knew all men. Jesus already had in mind the 12 men who would become his disciples and his apostles. Someone say amen. So he didn't commit himself to any of these and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. In other words, he didn't need me to go tell him what an awesome dude Samuel is. I'm just picking on you today, Sam. Samuel's a man of God, just so you know, if you don't know him, amen? He's a man of God. That's why I like to pick on him, because I know it's not going to bother him. He's not going to be offended, right? Whew. Okay, thank you, brother. So listen, he didn't need the testimony of man. He didn't need me to give a resume for Samuel or for Pamela or for Jill. He already knows Samuel, everything about him. Knows his going in and his coming out. He knows you so well, he's got every hair on that head of yours numbered. Has a number assigned to it, Samuel. That's a lot of numbers, right? He's got a number assigned to it. So if one falls out, there's number 3,255 just fell on the ground. That's how well God knows you. You need to understand this is what the Lord teaches. He knows you and I intimately and deeply. Amen? Mark 3.13, he went up on the mountain, called to him those he himself wanted, and they came to him. He called his apostles, called his disciples. He knew each one by name, knew everything about them. They were the ones he chose. Someone say amen. James, now we're getting to the good part here. James, <clears throat> Mark Chapter 3, verse 17, James, the son of Zebedee, John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bernanches, that is, sons of thunder. Everybody say sons of thunder. People are like, that's kind of a strange name. Why would God call these two brothers? And James and John and Peter, the three of them, became the inner circle for the Lord. Somebody say the inner circle. They became the inner circle of the Lord, right? Why in the world would he call them sons of thunder? Did you know in the book of Revelation that God promises that the man and woman, the believer in Christ who overcomes, when you stand before the Lord, he's going to give you one day a white stone with a new name written on it that nobody else knows except for you. Now I think that's the coolest thing in the world. People are like, what's my name? I don't know. God gives it to you. Nobody else could know. Right? So I'm not going to know. But I think it's going to be a cool name. I hope. Amen. But he gave these boys, James and John, this nickname, Sons of Thunder. Everybody say Sons of Thunder. Just sounds like it should be a movie, doesn't it? Sons of Thunder. Why do you think the Lord would call James and John the sons of thunder? Because he already knew about them. And there is something interesting about these boys. They were brothers. This is the story. Luke chapter 9, verse 52 through 56. And they sent messengers before the face of Jesus. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. So literally, James and John... They had sent, uh, and, and Jesus, the disciples, they had sent some messengers to go into this village of the Samaritans to prepare for Jesus, you know, to let everybody know the Messiah is coming, he's going to be praying for the sick, kind of like your pre-crusade meeting things, right? Kind of find a place for them to stay the night, food, that sort of thing. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. Now, when it says they did not receive him, that means they're like, hey, we're not interested. We're not interested. It's like Franklin Graham wanting to do a crusade in Abilene. This has not happened, by the way. And all the pastors getting together and saying, eh, we're not interested, right? I'd love for that to happen, by the way. We're not interested. So all the Samaritans, eh, we're not interested in Jesus coming. Nobody's willing to give up a room, no food, or anything else. If that was in modern times, we'd say, man, we really need to pray and fast for that city, right? But when his disciples, James and John, saw this, 
they heard what the messenger said. They said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Now, what was their nickname? Everybody say sons of thunder. What is associated with thunder? Lightning. And what does lightning cause if it hits something? Fire, right? Maybe the Lord knew a little bit about James and John at this point. But you know what's wonderful? John became the apostle of love. He went from being the son of thunder. Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? They, they wouldn't have asked that if they didn't expect God to, the Lord to say, yeah, sure. Elijah, in that story in the Old Testament, in your own time you can read it, but brief summary, this wicked king kept sending soldiers to arrest him. And those soldiers were had a mind to, they were coming with the wrong spirit to hurt him. And every time they came up to him, fire came out of his mouth and devoured them. Until finally the soldiers came humble, humble before the prophet of God, and God said, go with these, you'll be fine. But the other, I think there was two or three groups of soldiers got devoured by fire. So that's what James, and how many of you know, different situation, right? So James and John are thinking of this story, and what's Jesus say? He, Jesus, turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. Look at this next verse. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to what? But to what? To save them. And they went to another village. Jesus didn't come to start burning up the villages. That time's a coming. When Jesus returns a second time to establish his kingdom and the nations go to wage war against him, that time's coming. But between now and then, is an opportunity for mercy, an opportunity for grace, an opportunity for salvation. Because Jesus did not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. Jesus came to save your life. Everybody say, save my life. How many of you are thankful for that? I mean, really, in your heart, thankful. To save my life. To save your life. From what? From eternal fire and destruction. It's easy today to get caught up in the, they're all evil, God. Let's just destroy them all. Who said yes? <laughs> they're all evil. Let's just destroy them all. That was William. Did you know who said that? William Shakespeare. How many of you have heard of Shakespeare? You think of beautiful poetry, right? No, he was talking about the attorneys. And literally what he said, and this is a quote from William Shakespeare, is just kill all the attorneys and let God sort them out. Because they had, don't you all agree with that? They had no love, just like modern times, for the attorneys and all this stuff. Listen, guys, we live in days where there is hatred. And hatred is not some emotion, though it can be. It's lack of love, lovelessness. Everybody say lovelessness. An absence of love. Just like there's no such thing as darkness. Darkness is simply the absence of light. Darkness is not a thing. Light is a thing. It has protons and photons and beams and waves and everything else, right? Darkness, there's nothing. It's the absence of light. Hatred is nothing. It's the absence of love. And the world is consumed with it. The Bible teaches... Us, and I believe it's in 2 Timothy chapter 3, you can read through, there's a whole several verses about the attitudes and characteristics of the last days. One of them is that the love of many would grow cold, would wax cold. Love would grow cold. What does that mean? That means lovelessness. That means hatred. Everybody hating everybody. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. When they, they went to another village. 
Now be careful how you hear my message this morning. Desiring destruction of others is never the right choice, nor God's will. There is only one judge. Everybody say one judge. And that certainly is not you and certainly is not me. Can we all agree on that? There is only one judge. Don't des desire destruction of others. God commands us to pray for our enemies even. How many of you have ever had people you didn't get along with or people that did you wrong? People who were enemies, right? God doesn't just command you to forgive them. He commands you to love them. And on top of that, he commands you and I to bless and do good to those who do you bad. Whew. Somebody say, ouch. <laughs> that hurts, right? We have a hard time doing good to those who do good to us, let alone doing good to those who do bad to us. Because your flesh is like my flesh. It just wants to, uh, right? It gets that James and John spirit. Sons of thunder. Lord, let me just call fire down on them. No, God says, I want you to pray a blessing over their life. But Lord, you don't pray a blessing over their life. But Lord, but, no buts. What do you think the Lord Jesus meant when he said to them, you don't know what manner of spirit you are? What do you think? Why don't you think about that? We're going to find out. 1 John 3, 8 said this, Two weeks ago, I'll say it again, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, in context, it's talking about sin being the works of Satan. But this is the purpose that Jesus was brought to the planet, was to free mankind and destroy the works of the devil in the lives of human beings. That's how much God loves us. Someone say amen. Thank God for that. Amen. Because I often wonder... Lord, what would my life have been like without you in it? I don't even like to consider it. And I think, and I look back on all the goodness of God. He is always good. Verse 56, we read, The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to what? Save them. Always remember that. If you feel that, I call it the flesh, if you feel that, that lovelessness rising up in you, you've got to combat that. That is not the Spirit of God. But pastor, you don't understand what they did to me. God understands. He still says you're to love them. But, but, but. What manner of spirit is God? Everybody say God is love. Remember I had this mirror, and I was talking about your life and my life when people look at it reflecting and seeing who? Seeing the Lord Jesus, amen? If God is love, then what ought be the first thing they see in our lives as believers? Love. Now, the problem is we don't have the right definition of love, but we're going to look at that as well. Because you say love and the world thinks one thing, and God's people need to understand we're talking about God's love, his agape love. Let's look at this. 1 John 4, 7, 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. For everyone who loves is what? Born of God knows God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. That means you and I better love. If we say we're born of God and we know God, you better have the love of God showing and reflecting in your life. Someone say amen. If you're just one to call fire down on people, mean, angry, impatient, ill-tempered, it's not the love of God. It's the spirit of the Pharisees. He who does not love does not what? Let's read that again. Let's read it together. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. How much plainer can you make it? You're the Holy Spirit. You're wanting people to understand 
He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. That means the first quality and characteristic the world should see in the life of a believer is the love of God in our life. Amen? And how many of you know your love's not going to cut it? My love for people isn't going to cut it. I need the Holy Spirit's help to pour his love into me to give it to the world. Someone say amen. Because there are some people that are really unlovable. Make it really hard to love, but God still commands that we love them. I need his help with that. Anybody else out there? Some of you have three hands, right? God bless your honesty. God does not just have love or just display love. Listen to me. But his very essence is love. How many of you know there's a difference between saying God has love and saying God is love? That means apart from God, there is no, because God is love. That's why the world's idea of love is not God's idea of love. I don't want to get too deep here other than to say this. God is love. These are not emotions. These are not feelings. This is who he is. People are like, who was it? Toby, who just testified. He was talking to a guy at work, and the guy's like, well, I believe in the Holy Spirit, but I don't believe in God. Because his idea of the Holy Spirit is one thing. His idea of God is something. And how many? One. Amen. People are like, well, I love the God of the New Testament, but not the God of the Old Testament. Like, it's only one God. Everybody say one God. God is love. Amen. Perfect love has mercy, but perfect love also has judgment, boundaries, and everything else, right? When you love your children, you give them boundaries, don't you? And if they don't live up to those boundaries, there's going to be consequences. Isn't that right? Now, maybe children have parents that give you consequences. If you don't, you should. Parents, consequences, right? All right. Any manner of spirit that does not demonstrate his love is not of God. And not only is not of God, but does not even know God. Does not even know God. So what manner of spirit are you and I? We need to be demonstrating God's love. Why? Because God is love. So if God is love, how can I say that I know God and God is love and I have no demonstration of God's love in my life? Now, how many of you know that his love, you're always growing in that, right? You're not like, hey, last week I had none of God's love. This week my meter's filled to full. No, you'll go your whole life learning to live out God's love. Someone say amen. Someone who claims to know God must love others. If loveless, they show they can't love God at all. Someone who claims to know God must love others. There is none of this, well, I love God, but, you know, I hate people, and so I'm just going to stay with just me and God. I'm going to live like the, the monks. I call it the spirit of the monk. You know what the spirit of the monk is? Or the spirit of the... Uh, you know, I'm going to get a cab in the woods and live by myself, just me and my Bible. And I'm going to love God. Well, do you know how in error that is? Not that it wouldn't be fun. Because how can you say you love God and not love people? You can't. You've got to love people. And if you say you love God and don't have love for people, then the Bible says you don't know God. Just read it to you, right? I didn't make it up. I'm the messenger, right? So we've got to love people. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, as we start to come in for a landing. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or cl sounding clanging cymbals. Well, I speak in tongues. Well, I speak in tongues. But if I don't have love... 
to God, it's just like a... Uh, you're, how many of you remember the gong show? So the gong show, back when I was a kid, for those of you who are the younger generation, it was like this TV show, and it was almost like, um, you know, America's Great Got Talent type thing, except instead of the X, they'd have this big gong. And if they were, like, making your ears bleed because their singing was so bad, somebody from the judges would go up there and strike the gong and to make them quit so it didn't kill you, right? It was called the gong show, right? So listen, your stuff you do, your religious stuff, even if it's spirit-filled stuff, if you don't have love, it's like a gong being hit before God. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, man, you're just the greatest teacher since Wonder Bread, right? You've got everything down to a T. You have all faith to remove mountains, but you don't have love. You are nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, man, you're just a generous soul. You give your body to be burned even as a martyr. That's back when the Romans were like burning Christians as Roman candles, right? In the Garden of Nero. But have not love, it profits what? Profits me nothing. Not that any of those things are bad things, but you better make sure that the spirit that you and I are operating out of in these end times is the love of God. Everybody say the love of God. You could say, I go to church, but if you have not love, it's nothing. I go to Sunday school. I read my Bible. I do this. I do that. I volunteer at Houses for Healing. This, that, and the other. But if you have not love, it's nothing. Having read this, what aspect of the nature of Christ do you think we should make sure is a priority in our life? Everybody say love. Love. Then you say, well, what in the world is love, Pastor? Well, good thing the Bible tells us that. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, amen? Verses 4 through verse 8. Love. Now listen, remember we say God is love. What's cool about this, you can actually replace the word love with Heavenly Father. And you'll see his character and nature because he is love. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant. You ever met somebody that's arrogant and proud? They're just so full of themselves it makes their, you just think their head's going to burst any moment, right? It's not rude. Nothing worse than a rude believer, like an oxymoron. It does not insist on its own way. Ho, ho, ho. What? Christians, believers, love does not insist on its own way. Well, it's my way or the highway, buddy. Churches have split over blue carpet or red carpet because half didn't get their way. Oh, my goodness. In the span of eternity, you know how much that's going to matter? Everybody say zero. Love does not insist on its own way. Love is not, it is not irritable or resentful. If you're one of those people it's always irritable, always have a chip on your shoulder. I know nobody here, but maybe somebody out somewhere else. Always have a chip on your shoulder, always irritable, always resentful. Well, why'd that person get that instead of me? I'm more deserving. Why'd that person get recognized? Why'd this person get that? Why'd that person get that? It's not love. Love, it is not irritable. Everybody say not irritable. Not resentful. How many of you think some of us, as I read this, we're like, oh, I got a long way to go, Lord, amen? <laughs> Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Church should not be rejoicing in all the evil that's going on out there. The newest thing to make you want to puke this week is the uh, drag queen. 
wrote a Christian song and got all their drag queen friends and everybody else to support it to boost it to number one on the Christian billboard list. I'm not even going to say the song. Yeah, it's true. You can look it up. You can fact check me. It's in there. Sent the link to it to our worship leader yesterday. <clears throat> love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Amen. God love the people but hate the sin. Someone say amen. amen. Hate the evil, love the people. Can't do that. No, you can't, but God can. He can show you how. You've got to look through and see how they can be in God's eyes, if they got born again, filled with the Spirit, repented of their sin, how they could be the man and women of God they could be. And that'll help you love them. Someone say amen. Because God can take the worst person, the most evil doer, like Saul of Tarsus, right? And turn him into the greatest apostle. Did you know that there's men who served with Al-Qaeda and ISIS who have killed people and Christians who are now serving the Lord Jesus Christ and willing to give their life. God, listen to me, God's honest truth, heard their testimonies in a secret meeting with the pastors for security's sake. And I'm telling you, God can move in people's life. Remember, the devil came to destroy people Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil in people's life. Amen? Love bears all things. Everybody say bears all things. It doesn't mean love is a bear. Right? Not rude, not irritable. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and what? Endures all things. Man, today, somebody gets their feelings hurt. Dear Lord, they're ready to get divorced tomorrow. Divorce rates are as bad in the church as they are in the world. Terrible, saints. Coming in for a landing. Hang in there. Your stomach, it ain't going nowhere, I promise you. It'll be there when you leave. It was there when you came in. We ran out of donuts this morning, I saw. And it'll be there when you leave. Love hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Everybody say love never fails. Love never fails. Never, ever, ever fails. The very first name of my first ministry I ever had, even before I was working as an evangelist in a little town of Baycliffe. This before I was preaching under a tent of lights in East Texas. And I had put together a group of people, young people and adults. And one of them, this couple, owned a garage, of course. And they said, Bruce, if you guys want to fix up the garage, y'all can use it for an outreach center. So we remodeled it, sheetrocked it, put a couple fans in there, some lights. We went into the community. Every week, door to door, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, praying for the sick. Saw God do some incredible things. People get saved who are still walking with the Lord to this day. But the name of the ministry, we called it, was Love Never Fails. Beautiful name, Love Never Fails. Listen, God's love never fails, guys. Amen? And it's not based on emotion. Listen, when you see somebody, Joshua, you see somebody on the streets, and they look all nasty, and they smell like they hadn't bathed in three months, and they've been puking all over themselves. You can still make the choice to love them. Someone say amen. Because love is not a feeling. Young people, you run across somebody at school that's being picked on and bullied. You make the choice to love them. Not because they're just some super person, but because that's what Jesus would do. Amen? Someone say amen. God is love. This shows us exactly the nature of Heavenly Father and should become our nature as well. 
Is this how you and I think of Heavenly Father when you think of His nature? How do you think of God? I think of God as love. Everybody say, God is love. Are you picturing somebody up there with a big baseball bat ready to cream you at your first mistake? It's not God. He is a loving Heavenly Father. He's the most loving. How many of you grew up without dads besides me? So listen, it might be harder for us, but just know your Heavenly Father is the most loving dad you could ever imagine. Amen? But you see, he's not the kind of love we think of today. We think of love in the world, and the world thinks of love where, you know, if you don't agree with me, you don't love me. I have my evil and my wickedness, and if you don't agree with it, you hate me. You ever heard that? Christians hate homosexuals because we don't agree with their lifestyle. No, we love you. We just don't agree with your activities or that you can be involved in those activities and serve Christ. Someone say amen. But I choose to love you. I will talk to you. I will pray with you. I will share the gospel with you. I will lay down my life for you. But don't expect me to agree with you. That is not love. Jesus doesn't agree with sin. Someone say amen. But the world thinks love is, you don't agree with me, Jeremy, so you don't love me. (laughs) How many of you all married in here? How many of you think that if you didn't agree with your spouse or your spouse never agreed with you on one thing or about one thing, that you would just, he doesn't love me because he didn't agree with me. Oh my gosh, we'd all be divorced, right? You put two people in the same room, they're not going to agree about everything. Someone say amen. Amen. But we can agree on this. We need to love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not seek its own. Love is not irritable. It's not rude. Amen. It's not self-willed. Do you think today's culture has a warped sense of what love really is? Stand to your feet. Love is not agreement with sin. Everybody say not agreement with sin. It's a shame I have to even say this in speaking of God's love. God does not agree with sin, amen? And if somebody defines God's love as that, his love is the exact opposite. If a father sees his children doing and making choices that he knows are self-destructive in their life, his love will compel him to tell them and share with them the truth. Someone say amen. Amen. Not to agree with them. Are there areas of your own life, your own life now, that you see clearly now that you must grow into Father's love so that you reflect Jesus? I hope so, because none of us are there. Everybody's at a different spot, but we're all still working on this thing. Amen? Have you ever met someone who claims the name of Christ but demonstrated no glimmer of his love toward others? That's not how we need to be, amen? I want people to see me to see a reflection of God's love. Sometimes it requires time, sometimes it's hard. Why? Because love isn't selfish. If all you're ever doing is looking out for your own stuff, your own self, that's not love. That's how the world lives. Am I right? 